Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, are there any questions for this participant? This is public comment, so we cannot respond by law. Sorry, thank you. I just wanna make sure that we are aware that public comment is for items that are not currently on our agenda. Um, and so I just wanna make sure we're aware of that. And then also, um, Ms. Solis is present. And Mayor Council, this is Sterling. Uh, this is not part of the uh, item tonight on the agenda, so it's okay for public comment. Thank you. Okay, next. Go ahead. Dear Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members, my name is Robert Newstadt from Keep Flagstaff Together, and I would like to address you on the issue of sight and release. As you know, people in our system are presumed innocent until proven guilty. Jail, in our view, should be reserved for cases of violence when someone is a risk to society. People accused of nonviolent misdemeanors should not be incarcerated. Although Flagstaff Police Department's site and release policy gives officers the discretion, our suspicion is that there are cases of community members who are being taken to jail unnecessarily. To arrest people unnecessarily is a waste of limited resources and is furthermore harmful. During the COVID pandemic, it is outright dangerous for everyone, those arrested, jail personnel, and the community at large. Many, if not most, of those arrested in Flagstaff are people of color from the indigenous, black, and Latino communities. How can we heal the wounds of history if we continue to punish economically disadvantaged members of the population? When undocumented individuals are taken to jail, furthermore, they are often turned over to ICE, detained and ultimately removed from the country and separated tragically from their families. Keep Flagstaff Together advocates for an inclusive and welcoming city with policies and practices that honor the diversity of our, our community. By making the site and release policy the default, by not arresting nonviolent community members, we can progress towards making Flagstaff a place to be proud of. Here, I'll go ahead Thank and dial you. the next. ready to set start oh okay okay thank you hello my name's should i begin yes yes please okay okay thank you for the opportunity to speak today um and i want to say uh, good afternoon to the mayor and the city council um and i want to contribute to the community conversation on police policy and practices. My name is Gary Perlmutter. And I am the chief operating officer of the Southwest Center of Equal Justice. Um, and I want to provide some thoughts on the importance of having a robust site and release policy within the Flagstaff Police Department and how it improves public safety. There are other good reasons to have a robust policy, including the costs of the city uh, associated with their arrest and booking and fairness to the individual offenders, but I'm not here to address them. I just want to talk about um, misdemeanor offenders. Most of them are low risk. That is, they are far less likely to reoffend. As a matter of public policy and best practices, low risk offenders should not be arrested. You know, there are reasonable exceptions, such as for domestic violence or assault, for example. Um, many harms can result from arrests of low-risk offenders. Criminal justice literature is replete with documentation that they are much more likely to come into contact with medium to high-risk offenders upon arrest. And most low-risk offenders have good pro-social values and attitudes uh, and associate with others who are similar uh, 
values and attitudes, such as respect for other people's personal integrity and their property, accountability for one's actions, good work ethic, those, for example. Uh, if arrested, they are removed from pro-social settings, and they are very likely to assimilate uh, the antisocial values and attitudes of the medium to high-risk offenders. Low-risk offenders do not influence and change the values of the high-risk uh, offenders. The trajectory is just basically one way. High-risk offenders influence the values and attitudes of low-risk offenders, and they become high to, uh, medium to high-risk offenders themselves, much more quickly than uh, most folks can imagine. Uh, it's interesting that National Public Radio uh, just discussed this same conclusion in an article uh, this morning with regards to the criminal um, laws that were passed in the 90s that resulted in locking up a lot more offenders. And they, and they talked about how the literature says it does not make us safer. Um, the other the, uh, benefits uh, to cite relief for low-risk offenders is it protects not only them, but their families. They return to their normal settings where pro-social values were reinforced. So Thank you. In sum, uh, Thank you. the bottom line is a robust uh, site release policy advances thank public you. policy uh, and public safety. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, Mayor, we did have two people who indicated that they were interested in speaking in this group, but unfortunately I did not receive their phone numbers. So I'm going to go ahead and call the last speaker on this item. Okay, thank you. Mayor, I did. I received her voicemail, so we are set to move on. Okay. Um, we are now down to item number five of our agenda. This is a review of the draft agenda for the October 20th, 2020 council meeting. Council, do you have any items you'd like to discuss? I do not see any indicated. I just want to remind council um, that this is for any items that we want to re discuss on next week's agenda. If for some reason you do decide that you have questions, if you could make sure you get that to our city manager as soon as possible um, so we can get those questions answered, that would be appreciated. We are now down to item number six of our agenda. Item number six is the Arizona Department of Transportation, ADOT, update on the Milton and the US-180 corridor master plans. Good evening, Mayor. This is Rick Barrett, city engineer. Um, I'll be introducing this item. And first of all, can you hear me? Hello? Rick, we can hear you. You're, maybe could it be a little louder? Um, okay. I'll try to speak louder or closer to the microphone. Um, Thank you. So again, Good evening, Mayor Evans, Vice Mayor and Council Members, um, Rick Barrett. I'll be introducing this item that Mayor Evans just read off for us um, and offer that city staff will be available for Council discussion after ADOT's presentation. This presentation is an update to discuss progress made to date on both the Milton Corridor Master Plan and the US 180 Corridor Master Plan and to discuss next steps, including working paper number two and public outreach. So let me introduce our speakers. First of all, we have uh, Dan Gabio. Are you ready to go, Dan? Do you want me to pull up the presentation for us? I see Dan, but we can't hear you. It appears you might still be on mute. Okay. 
Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Dan. Please try again. I'm sorry, we cannot. It looks like you're signed in on two devices. Dan, could you please try star six on your phone to see if that will unmute you on that device? Hmm. Unfortunately, it did not. Is his computer? Yeah. Try again, please. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. OK, sorry about that, everyone. You might just want to mute your computer and leave your phone on. How is that? Much better, thank you. I apologize for the delay, everyone. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Dan, do you want me to pull up my screen? I'd be glad to run the presentation from my end. That would be great if you could, Rick, thank you. Okay, let me do that here. Um, first of all, let me get it going over here. Um, I'm sorry, I don't want to show the speaker notes. Um, Okay, can you see my screen here now? No, not, not yet, Rick, not yet. Okay. It should be this one. Okay, we're there, Rick, thank there you. you. Okay. So Dan, um, I think we're ready to go. So we have Dan Gabio, which is ADOT's Regional Planning Manager, and he will be joined by Kevin Kugler, which is ADOT's Consultant with Michael Baker International Planning Department Operation Manager. With that, let's, let's uh, take it away, gentlemen. Thank you, Rick. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. Thank you all for allowing me to provide uh, a brief overview and update of the Milton Road and US 180 Quarter Master Plans. Please feel free to ask any questions at any time before and after the presentation. Uh, Kevin and I both have our contact information at the end of the presentation, should you need to follow up with us. Next slide, please. So this is just an overview of the study areas. Uh, the entire Milton Road Quarter Master Plan area is less than two miles, starting from Forest Meadow Street to the south and ending at Route 66 and Beaver Street. The US 180 corridor is about 17 and a half miles, starting from Route 66 and Humphrey Street intersection and going about 10 miles past Snowball Road to accommodate snowplay traffic. We decided to uh, merge these two studies from a project management perspective and evaluate them concurrently uh, due to the impacts of Milton Road on US 180. Next slide, please. These are the study objectives for both quarter master plans. And these are taken directly from the charter, which we created when we started the quarter master plans about three years ago. It should be noted that from the get-go, we've used a partnership approach and strive to reach a consensus on all major decisions with our partner agencies, which include the City of Flagstaff, Metro Plan, Mountain Line, Pocono County, NEU, the Forest Service, the Federal Highway Administration, and BNSF Railway. It should be noted that in addition to these objectives for US 180, we're also placing a special emphasis on winter congestion. On the bottom bullet, uh, PEL stands for Planning Environmental Linkages, and NEPA stands for the National Environmental Policy Act, the purpose of this bullet is to advise that we're following a process to help streamline decision making 
for the next step. Next slide, please. So this graphic de depicts why it's been over two years since the last time I provided an update. About two and a half years ago, we used the direct input from the public to help us reduce our range of alternatives for both corridors. For the past two years, we've gone through two more rounds of data-driven analysis. I'll be providing a brief overview of that analysis today, and then our intent is to go to the public to obtain critical input on helping us identify recommended alternatives for each corridor. Next slide, please. This graphic depicts the results of our second round of analysis. Based on the alternative analysis results and input from the uh, project partners, alternatives three and four were eliminated. The remaining alternatives move forward to round three for alternative analysis. So we carry, carry forward the no-build, as well as what we're calling the no-build plus, which includes spot improvements, but does not add additional lanes. We're also including alternative five, which is a six-lane facility, uh, all general purpose lanes. Alternative 6A is an eight-lane facility, which includes six general purpose lanes and two managed lanes uh, specific for bus use, uh, bicycle use, and right turn users. Alternative 6B is a four-lane facility with, again, outside lane uh, managed lanes for buses, cyclists, and right turn users. And alternative 13 is a six-lane facility, four lanes that are general purpose, and two lanes are bus-only lanes in the center. Next slide, please. This is the results of our third round of alternative analysis specific to travel time. We developed some uh, very detailed traffic models, which were able to run the alternatives to determine how long it would take to drive through the corridor based on those specifications that I just described. Uh, with that, uh, there is a noticeable change in travel time results between our Tier 2 analysis and Tier 3 analysis. The reason being is the Tier 2 traffic model primarily considered the lane configurations only. Our more detailed Tier 3 model also included several spot improvements, which we identified with our partners based on both partner input and the public's input, and these consisted of multiple improvements to pedestrians, cyclists, transit users, uh, and general safety. So unfortunately, as you can see by the, the red color, um, the traffic modeling results indicate that the build alternatives would perform worse than the no-build situation if we were to do nothing in the southbound AN peak and in both directions during the PM peak. Uh, again, uh, primarily due to the additions that we made, the multimodal improvements. Um, with that, we still do receive a benefit in the northbound AM peak. Um, but as you can see, uh, the results indicate that it's not easy for us to be able to build our way out of congestion on Milton Road. Next slide, please. This slide shows, uh, it's a little bit difficult to see here, so just to describe it on the top, the colorful depiction is a much more detailed uh, breakdown of all the evaluation criteria that we use in our third round of analysis. Um, these criteria include uh, traffic operations, vehicular safety, expanding travel mode choices, public acceptance, cost and implementation, environmental impacts, and community character. And each of those categories have several additional criteria that we agreed to use uh, from a consensus-based approach with our partners. It should be noted that the weighting that we use as far as which criteria are more important than others, we developed a survey and we use the average of both our project partner responses and the public response. And it should be noted that we received almost 600 responses from the public in a two-week period, uh, which directly impacted this analysis. Uh, I want to thank the city for allowing us to use the city's community forum to distribute that survey. It was very beneficial to the project. 
It should also be noted that two of our criteria, public acceptance and community character, have not yet been complete. We still intend to share the results with the public and to obtain the public's direct feedback to finish our analysis. With that on the bottom, this table is just a high-level overview of those results. Again, the no-build or do-nothing scenario from a technical perspective without having completed the, the public input is currently ranked number one. The no-build plus, again, uh, existing lane configuration plus multimodal spot improvements is ranked number two. Alternative 6A, the eight-lane facility is ranked number three. Alternative 6B, the uh, four, uh, Six lane facility with uh, two bus lanes is ranked number four. Alternative five, the six lane all vehicle alternative is ranked number five. And alternative 13, which is the center bus lane alternative is ranked number six. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm, I'm uh, still seeing slide seven on my screen. Uh, Rick, if you could advance. There you go. Thank you. Um, so that was the summary of the Milton Road analysis to date. Uh, now I'd like to get into the US 180 alternatives analysis. Um, with that, these were the alternatives that we evaluated on US 180 after having eliminated many alternatives based on public input. We have Alternative two, which is a managed lane in the PM peak for afternoon peak. We have alternative three, which is a four lane facility plus a center median for turning. It would also include four foot bike lanes. Alternative four A is a managed lane for both the AN and PM peak periods plus bike lanes, a larger buffer and a 10 foot multi-use path. Alternative four B, is that same concept as 4A, but the managed lane would be for buses only. And alternative six includes an outside shoulder for buses in the southbound direction only. Uh, so in addition to these alternatives that we looked at on existing US 180, if you could advance to the next slide, please. We also looked at several alternatives which would bypass US 180. We originally had four bypass alternatives which would connect US 180 to I-40. Uh, we eliminated two based on feedback from the public. And we further evaluated these two alternatives in the blue, uh, further northwest, starting at Wing Mountain. We looked at alternative 17, the Wing Mountain Bypass. And in green, we also looked at alternative 18, the Hidden Hollow Bypass. Uh, based on uh, our analysis, uh, to jump to jump ahead a little bit, I'll just say that we have agreed with our partners to eliminate uh, these alternatives from further evaluation based on the results of the analysis. Next slide, please. So with US 180, it's a little bit more complex for Milton in that we have both urban, suburban, and rural characteristics of the corridor. So we evaluated our alternatives and put them into packages based on the corridor character. So our first segment um, from Route 66 to Columbus Road was our urban evaluation. Uh, that's Humphrey Street. We also looked at Columbus to Peak View, which is more suburban in nature. And then from Peak View to Snowball Road, which is more rural. And then we also looked at Snowball Road all the way to Crawley Pit. Next slide, please. So these are the travel time results for US 180. What the results tell us is that without improving traffic operations to Milton Road, there are not much capital improvements that we could do on US 180 or even bypassing US 180 that would yield a noticeable benefit. Based on the negative to minimal traffic operation uh, benefits, ADOT and our project partners uh, would recommend to the public that a new alternative, which we're calling the no-build plus spot improvements, 
would be recommended on US-180. We'll still allow the, the public to weigh in on all of the alternatives, but what ADOT and our partners have realized is, is that there's just not a substantial benefit from uh, adding capital improvements on US-180 compared to the severe impacts and costs of these bill alternatives and potential bypass alternatives. We'll also get into it in just a moment, but again, the as I mentioned earlier, Milton Road has a, a huge impact on the operations of US-180, and so we'll um, review that in just a moment. Next slide, please. So again, the, the analysis concludes that there is a significant correlation between the traffic delay on US-180 and the operations on Milton Road. If you recall from the Milton Road traffic analysis, we were still seeing a negative traffic impact from our build alternatives, particularly in the southbound direction, where we have the most challenging uh, time for travel on US-180 in the winter months. Um, so without improvements to travel time on Milton Road, the potential to see improvements on US-180 is very unlikely. The ma uh, majority of the public input received on US-180 generally did not support by bypasses or adding lanes on US-180. And again, ADOT and our project partners will recommend the No Build Plus alternative on US-180 to the public. And again, PLUS will include several multimodal improvements on US-180, but not adding lanes. Uh, one more note on the, the US-180 is that um, Mountain Line uh, also completed a US-180 implementation plan in 2018, finding that the winter weekend congestion delays were typically in the 25 to 30 minute range over the past couple of years. Uh, so many of the improvements, the non-capital improvements that have been made by multiple agencies over the past several years, such as increased transit service, uh, enhanced no parking, enforcement, and some of the snowplay area closures have contributed to overall travel improvements on US-180 during winter weekends. So these were also factored into our recommendation. Next slide, please. With that, um, our next steps is we intend to publish our working paper two alternatives analysis for both corridors. Uh, we're targeting to publish that by the end of the month. Once we do that, we're still intending to have extensive public outreach in mid-November, where we intend to have a virtual public meeting for each quarter master plan. We'll also be following up with an additional online public survey. We'll be doing additional community outreach um, to some of the low-income and minority groups within the area uh, to ensure that we're reaching out to uh, underserved populations. And we'll also be coordinating with the Chamber of Commerce, CDB, and other stakeholders to ensure that the notices uh, get out to the business community. And we'll be providing some targeted questions in our survey um, to make sure that we're getting proper and adequate responses from the business community regarding our analysis and recommendations. Next slide, please. With that, that concludes the presentation. Um, on this slide, you can see the websites for both, both of the quarter master plans, and I'm able to answer any questions you might have now. If you have any follow-up questions, you're welcome to contact myself or my consultant project manager, Kevin Kluger, with any questions or comments you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. McCarthy. Thank you. Um, did your analysis look at uh, the impact that the Lone Tree Corridor, that's, uh, the, the ideas that are being floated around for the Lone Tree and, and the bridge over the railroad, uh, will those have any impact on uh, Milton? Yes, sir. Uh, in fact, once we identified that the Lone Tree improvements were going to be funded um, through the city's tax initiative, we then added those improvements into our traffic model. So the impacts of the Lone Tree project are in fact analyzed as part of this project. And they're significant? They do make an impact. Um, we found that 
uh, we, we did actually model it before uh, those improvements and after, and we did find that the Lone Tree uh, uh, project did have an effect on traffic operations for Milton Road. Um, Kevin might be able to follow up with the exact amount, but I, I think it was somewhere in the, the realm of about 10% uh, improvement to Milton Road. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor and Dan. Thank you for the presentation and your efforts uh, on this for our community. A couple questions. You know, when we prioritize bus buses specifically and give them bus only lanes, um, how does that impact the calculation of the potential flow of, of vehicle? So it it does have uh, some impact and that was incorporated into our traffic model results. Um, Rick, I'm not sure if you're able to backtrack to slide six. Um, this might help in my explanation. Thank you. So the, the alternatives to have the managed bus lanes again are 6A, 6B, and 13, each having a slightly different specification um, and slightly different other improvements that we looked at to ensure that these alternatives are the best that they could be. Um, and with that, um, the results are slightly different for each of the alternatives. Um, as you can see and could expect with alternative 6A, which is the eight lane facility, six general purpose lanes and two managed bus lanes, uh, that would have the, the better performance uh, of the, the three options. Um, and then we see alternative 6B, which is the six lane facility, two outside managed lanes for buses, cyclists and uh, right turn users. Um, this one yielded um, about the, the next best. Um, so you can see a change in travel time overall of 6.6 .6 minutes compared to 7.6 minutes, about uh, one minute saving in the AM. And then in the PM, uh, we're having about the opposite effect. So the, under the no build condition, it would take about 6.6 .6 minutes of travel time, whereas alternative 6B would take an additional minute, 7.6 .6 minutes of travel time. And then similar result for alternative 13, which was the center bus lane concept Again, we're seeing a, a net gain in the AM, uh, again, all within the, the northbound direction uh, of about a minute, and then a net loss in the PM travel time of almost a minute. Thank you for that, Dan. I'm sure it's kind of hard to calculate that because I know it relies on you know how often the buses come, where do they take you to, where do they not take you to, first and last mile, et cetera, et cetera. But without getting into that, you know, I'm glad to see Alternative 5 rising to the top so far in these um, in the study. And my only comment is, um, you know, it just, I mentioned this last time we had this conversation, but anytime I see a bicycle adjacent to moving vehicles, I have concerns because that ultimately is an environment of which will be prohibitive to many in our community who might choose to take, you know, leave their car at home and ride their bike. So I just ask that moving forward, if we can, you know, put, put into these alternatives, options of which pull that lane off the road and maybe, you know, make a larger sidewalk of which the lane can be, you know, next to or adjacent to, or at least up on the curb rather than, you know, adjacent to a vehicle. Thank you, sir. We'll, we'll definitely take that common consideration. And just along those lines, is that is that something that that you've done, you've worked on in the past, like a separated bicycle lane? So within our alternatives for Milton Road, um, two of the alternatives do have a separate dedicated bike lane. Uh, that would be alternative five, the, the six lane general purpose lane facility and alternative 13, which is the center bus lane alternative. Alternative 6A and 6B 
both have a, a shared bus and bicycle lane. Um, all of the build alternatives, though, do have a, a wider sidewalk facility uh, of, of 10 feet. Um, however, uh, we wouldn't be encouraging cyclists to be riding on the sidewalk. They, the sidewalks were not um, intended to serve as a multi-use path in, in this situation. And I think just with the alternatives, you know, alternative five and some of the others that have more of a, you know, divided section between the vehicle and the bicycle. If we do go with an option like that, I would just advocate that we put in those little flaps or something like that to create more of a buffer between the cyclist and the, the driver of a vehicle. Um, thank you. Thank you for your comments, sir. Mr. Odegaard? Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the presentation. I just had a, a question. It's kind of a follow-up question with Councilmember McCarthy's question. Um, since there was an exercise done concerning um, the propositions that were passed by the voters here in Flagstaff in 2018 concerning, you know, like the Lone Tree Overpass Bridge and maybe the widening of Lone Tree, uh, was there an exercise done knowing those two uh, projects will be completed in the future about maybe another exercise of adding a lone tree interchange off of I-40. Was that exercise done by chance? The connection to I-40 along lone tree was not included in our traffic models. Um, for specific to our traffic models, we only included projects that are currently, uh, currently have funding commitments within either the city's capital improvement program or ADOT's transportation improvement program. Um, with that, we had we had that uh, concurrently or uh, consistently uh, considered for all the alternatives. We only included funded projects within the traffic model. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I have a question. Um, I'm going to miss Whelan and then I'm going to have my question. Ms. Whelan. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, can you tell me whether there is ADOT funding to complete any of these projects? I'm sure. I'm sorry. I have to ask you to repeat that one more time for me. Can you tell me? I mean, we're clear that there is city monies to complete projects, but is there state money, ADOT money to complete these projects? That's a good question. Currently, we do not have any funding uh, programs to complete the these build alternatives. ADOT mm -hmm. does have some minor spot improvement projects programmed right now, um, many of which uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of. Uh, there's a, a southbound right turn lane project on Humphrey Street connecting Humphreys to Route 66. There's also a pavement preservation project on Milton Road, which will include over $2 million worth of uh, sidewalk improvements to meet Americans with Disabilities Act compliance. But in addition to those projects that are already programmed, ADOT does not have additional funds committed to implementing the quarter master plan recommendations at this time. Once the quarter master plans are complete, we will include the recommendations into ADOT's performance-based programming process. We're required by law to go through a performance-based programming process to prioritize all projects statewide, and then we would submit our recommendations to the State Transportation Board for approval. Thank you. And so really, I just wanted to follow up on what Ms. Willen's question was, because my question was, are there any funding sources that have been identified within this planning, um, this planning document or could be identified? You know, we have a plan. It's an older plan for Milton. I believe the price tag to fix Milton years ago was $800 million. And so I guess, you know, in understanding that there, there hasn't been state funding identified, um, to help, uh, I guess, bring the plan to fruition. What happens to the plan after it's done? Thank you, Mayor. Great questions. Um, we are considering 
the implementation of the project. So we actually included that as one of our evaluation criteria. And we received help from Metro Plan and other partners to identify potential grant sources that would be available and the recommendations would be eligible for. And so we did incorporate that uh, implementation potential as part of prioritizing the projects. Um, of course, it's still uh, a, a little bit early at this time to confirm whether or not we would receive a grant. Uh, we would still have to go through a competitive process like any other agency to compete for those grants. So it's, it's certainly not confirmed that any of these projects or any of these build alternatives would be funded once this is complete. However, um, again, we would still include the recommendations in ADOT's overall performance-based programming process, and we would look at all potential partnering and other implementation strategies to fund the recommendations as soon as we could. What's the lifespan on this plan? So typically studies are for a 20-year period. We've modeled everything and analyzed everything for a 20-year period, assuming that these recommendations should be built by 2040. Um, with that, they could certainly be built before that as soon as funding would be available. The lifespan depends on changes. So if there are significant changes to conditions, such as traffic counts, population, um, if other projects come up that we weren't anticipating, we could then consider reanalyzing the study if there were significant changes to existing conditions that we didn't consider. Thank you. Mr. Odegaard? Yeah, Mayor, I just had a follow-up question. Uh, there was a mention about a preservation project for Milton Road. Um, what construction season will that happen? I do not have all the details on the construction of that, uh, of the construction project, but I could follow up with our district office and then get you a response to that. Okay, thank you. Council, any more questions? Okay, thank you. We appreciate the presentation. Thank you very much. We're going to move down to item number seven of our agenda. Item number seven is our Red Gap Ranch grazing lease scope. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. This is Mark Richardson. I am the Operations Manager for uh, Water Services, and I've got a brief presentation a little bit on uh, Red Gap Ranch, and then we'll open it up to discussions relative to the scope for our grazing lease. Can everybody see the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, Red Gap Ranch, it's located uh, approximately 30 miles uh, to the east over toward uh, Winslow. Uh, this map shows it's a uh, quick travel right along Route 40. Uh, as you're going out, the main entrance to the ranch is there at exit 239, Meteor City. As you're driving around, um, what you can barely see out of that uh, picture there, that's the dome that you would normally see or would have seen back um, if you traveled Route 66. And uh, it was actually an active store up until uh, early part of 2012. So a little bit about um, the history of Red Gap Ranch. In 2005, uh, we had a bond issue to purchase um, and secure future water supplies uh, for the city of Flagstaff. Um, then they went out, uh, they found, and they had uh, negotiations um, for Red Gap Ranch, and it consists of 8,500 acres of deeded lands and 15,000 acres of state lands, um, Arizona state lands, um, we have a grazing lease, the city of Flagstaff, um, which expires the end of December in 2023. And we will continue to uh, keep that up to date. And we'll file for that um, in 2023. Um, it also included 
a U.S. Department of Agricultural grant that came with the, the property when um, the prior owner um, had started some of that. Um, and really, the main purpose behind Red Gap were new wells and the water supply, and that is an integral part of our 100-year designation or having water supply. So this is actually a picture um, depicting or a map of the ranch. Um, you will see um, I-40 going through um, on the south side of the ranch to the north of the ranch is the Navajo Reservation. On the eastern side, that uh, main red line going up through, that's Loop Road that would then go up through. Um, blue are state lands, red, are the red gap or the, the properties that are owned outright by the city of Flagstaff. And then the white properties are privately held properties within the bounds of the incorporated ranch. And that incorporated ranch is, is shown by the black, um, black line with the X's all the way around. Um, U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program is the grant that we had. Um, it was for watering troughs, uh, for wildlife and grazing animals. Uh, there was a requirement. It was to maintain uh, these facilities for a minimum of 10 years, and that ends in 2020. There were four locations with wells that would then feed these watering locations. Um, and it also required that we have a grazing operator. And that was put out to bid um, in 2007. Uh, we had an agreement with Manarola Sheep Company, and he signed on. Then in 2014, uh, we had an extension. And then 2015 uh, was another uh, contract that was put out to bid. Um, and that was, again, Manarola Sheep Company. The uh, tanks that we discuss, um, these are the watering troughs that are shown. Um, whether it be outpost, sunshine, uh, cedar, or twin tanks. Um, those are the four that we've had and we have used and maintained, and we continue to maintain um, throughout the year. So a little bit about um, this I wanted to explain. Um, we have uh, the Natural, Natural Resource Conservation Service um, was an original partner on some of this. They're the ones that actually had the grant through Department of Ag. Um, this actually shows a fine lines that crisscross the ranch. Those are the, the plans or the, um, the fence lines that are either existing or planned for the ranch. Most of them are in place currently but they do need some maintenance, and that's why we've actually included that in our invitation for bids. Um, just a, an idea, so these are cross fences, and a cross fence is uh, limiting the, um, the, the grazing animals to one particular area of the ranch, so it's not a free range across the entire ranch. Most animals will probably stay within one mile of a watering location. And pretty much each one of our pastures within the ranch have a watering location that we can use if it's one of the four that we've done through the grant or some existing ones that need some upgrades. Uh, we have the potential for four. Um, but these are, are within the ranch. They do not include um, the perimeter fencing. That would be separate under the contracts, and that would be our responsibility as, um, as the owner of Red Gap Ranch. So we've done an invitation for bid. Um, we've actually been through various steps through the process, either looking for a request for proposals, um, but then the final product is the invitation for bid. Um, the majority of the points that we are looking for uh, within that uh, bid, um, first, it has to adhere to Flagstaff's community priorities and objectives. Um, 
That is a, a, a key part, and that includes the land stewardship um, or the environmental stewardship and the uh, sustainability. Then we have the integration of grazing and ecosystem health, land management best practices. Um, so there, we're hoping that uh, this will be a sustainable and bring back some of the ranch uh, into uh, the way it was originally. Uh, support the Flagstaff initiatives for sustainability, and that would be whether we're looking at uh, solar initiatives, carbon sequestration, or any of the other uh, programs that sustainability has that might work out there. Um, support the wildlife restoration. Um, we have uh, reduced livestock and wildlife conflicts. Um, working with institutions of higher learning, it is a great location. Um, we have three main higher institutions, our, our higher learning institutions, whether it be ASU, U of A, or NAU. Each one has specific programs that are different from the others that all could do something out there. Um, there are provide um, some grazing management plan. That is one thing that will be required um, of the, uh, the bidder or the grazing operator. They are limited to 181 animal units. And we define that or through the state um, so that would be a thousand pound animal would be one animal unit and then they break it out accordingly. Um, sheep would be 20% uh, of an animal unit. So there would be five sheep to one animal unit. Um, annual um, fence maintenance. We've looked at um, doing one mile per year of replacement or new um, four wire fences um, in the ranch. And then uh, domestic livestock um, is all that is allowed through the state lands lease. Uh, that would include the cows, horses, sheep, goats, and donkeys. Um, any of the exotic uh, wildlife would not be allowed at this time. And what we're looking for, um, I believe you have a scope of work. Um, we're looking for comments and any questions that you might have as we're putting this out uh, to bid. And I will wait for your comments. Okay, Council. Council, any comments? Ms. Whelan? Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Council, and thank you for um, this presentation. A question: Why do why is uh, the animal units limited to a hundred and eighty one? Um, Council Member Whelan, um, mm. the state lands um, sets the amount of animals that the property can sustain. Um, and through their analysis of Red Gap Ranch, they determined that 181 animal units are what can be sustained. Um, and it actually relates to the state lands. So it's within the state lands lease. Um, we then have to follow that. Uh, we can't exceed that because you will be using both uh, City of Flagstaff properties and state lands. So uh, we have over 20,000 acres that are being used out there. And what we're saying that over that acreage is it's um, deemed that 181 animal units could thrive there. That's correct. Um, State lands came out um, a few years ago, and that's the number that they actually put on that property. We've been yeah. out with state lands again, um, mm -hmm. and they they feel comfortable with that number uh, with the present condition. Um, I think over a year 
or two ago, Council Member Salas and I went with um, Brad Hill and uh, Aaron Young to to look at the property out there. Uh, and I remember some of the discussions were the conditions of the fencing, were the conditions of the tanks, and how that land uh, and, and those things on the land weren't necessarily being maintained as well as could be. Um, and that is about our stewardship. Is that correct? That would be correct. And that's okay. why we've put it a little bit more into um, into the, the uh, IFB that we've got going out. Um, fencing was never in there. Um, the maintenance of the tanks, um, we as a city are responsible for that, but within the IFB, we have it where the, the range manager or the grazing operator is responsible for uh, pumping the water, um, but we will maintain the well itself because that is our expertise. Um, but the tanks and a lot more of the maintenance of the ranch will go back onto the grazing operator. And are those four tanks currently in their troughs currently working and being used for the wildlife? Two have been in service. Um, two were taken out of service during mm -hmm. maintenance of the well. That has been now completed, and now the crews will be going back and refilling the tanks for the winter operations. Excellent. Well, I certainly appreciate um, taking into consideration the stewardship, the sustainability, and uh, the educational piece of that beautiful land out there uh, and how best it could um, thrive and the animals could thrive out there. So thank you very much. Okay, anything else, Council? Okay, that's all I see for this item. All right, thank you. We're going to go ahead and take a, let's take a eight minute break. We'll come back at uh, 10 minutes after four and pick up with our next item, item number eight. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. This is item number eight. This would be a discussion about alternative response models for the Flagstaff Police Department. We do have a um, public comment card, but I will take that after the presentation. Okay. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. My name is Dan Musselman. I currently serve as your interim police chief and I will be running this discussion. Tonight's discussion is about alternate response models. Go ahead and advance it, Marianne. Alternate response models, a good working definition is a practice of sending a paramedic, mental health professional, or crisis specialist with or instead of an officer to non-emergency calls. This can include mental health calls, substance abuse calls, homelessness related calls, or minor medical calls. The goal here is to connect the client or the citizen with the most appropriate services, keeping them safe and out of the justice system. This can help lessen the strain on emergency services and can reduce return calls on the same individual so long as long-term assistance is gained by the person, whether it be proper medication or substance abuse treatment. These models may help reduce the risk of violent civilian slash police encounters. For tonight's discussion, I'm gonna do my best to describe the who, what, when and where, and how of a few of the more common alternate response models. I'll talk about the STAR support team assisted response. That's out of Denver, Colorado, the Anchorage Safety Patrol and Center that's out of Anchorage, Alaska, 
in the Crisis Preparation and Recovery Program out of Mesa, Arizona, the Crisis Assessment and Response to Emergencies or CARE Program out of Memphis, Tennessee, and then perhaps the most uh, common one that people think of is CAHOOTS, which, which stands for Crisis Assist Assistance Helping Out on the Streets, and they're out of Eugene, Oregon. So the STAR programs out of Denver, Colorado, and this program is run by the police department. It's a six month pilot program and it was funded, funded by a voter approved grant. And that grant amount was 200,000. And the mental health people there, they feel they can navigate the city's mental health landscape more quickly than police officers can. And additionally, they have more time to spend to make sure people get exactly what they need. When Denver started their mobile co-response, they first sent a social worker and an officer together. The STAR team is kind of an advancement on that. And now only a paramedic and social worker respond if it's a non-emergency call. If it's an emergency call, the officer still goes and the STAR team will respond with the officer. Again, they take these calls via the 911 dispatch and this can include substance abuse, mental health crisis, or people that just need help connecting to services. This program runs from 10 to 6, uh, Monday through Friday. The next program I'd like to talk about is the Anchorage Safety Patrol and Center, again out of Anchorage, Alaska, and this one's managed by the Anchorage Health Department. It's fully funded by tax dollars, and vans go out and they do active patrol and or they can also be dispatched to those who appear incapacitate, incapacitated by alcohol or drugs in a public place. The cost, um, the most recent budget figures I could get for this program was they were running it for about 2 million per year in 2014. And I know that's a little dated, but that's all I could get. Their vans operate 24 seven and they use security officers that are cross-trained as emergency medical technicians. Clients are placed in protective custody for transport, and then they're taken to the safety center, which monitors them for detox. Clients can stay up to 24 hours, and they respond to 1,200 to 1,800 calls per month. Uh, if the person is combative, the police are called. Um, a little more about the security officers, EMTs. They are not armed, but they do wear body cameras. Um, and, and the way they are allowed to put people into protective custody is if the person is so intoxicated that they're a danger to themselves um, and need that help so that they don't freeze to death or fall into harm's way. The next program is out of Mesa, Arizona, and this one's unique because the police and fire each kind of have their own program with a licensed clinician assigned. The city staff of the program are funded out of the city base budget, and then crisis preparation recovery, which is a program, was originally funded by a $5.2 million grant to go on calls with the crisis response team um, on these calls. They do a tiered response to, depending on the need. So what that ends up being is if somebody's just in crisis and needs someone to talk to, that call may be screened off to the crisis line. If the crisis line can't help them, then the crisis line will dispatch Taros to the, to the location. If the call is more serious, um, that of an emergency nature, like someone's getting ready to cut their wrist or step in front of traffic, then police and fire respond along with the CPR team. Um, they've started their program roughly seven years ago and it has uh, evolved since then. Um, again, sorry, I think I already gave this to you. Um, police and fire make the scene safe and then the crisis preparation recovery takes over. Um, the their uh, CPR team includes a behavioral health tech and a licensed mental health clinician. And why that's important and a good idea is the behavioral health tech can be making calls to an agency, uh, seeing if they have a bed available or 
touching base with the person's doctor to see if they can refill meds or call in the food bank to see if they can get a food box box for the person. And the clinician is a higher level of care than fire. So fire department personnel feel comfortable releasing uh, the client into the care of the licensed mental health clinician. The clinician is also beneficial because they can fill out the commitment paperwork needed to get the person into treatment and and further diagnose them. Uh, they run 12 hour shifts. They average three calls per day. Another great thing is they have a follow up transitional care team that follows up with the client a day or two afterward to make sure they're following through with their treatment plan, getting to their appointments and getting their support system in place. And I think that's all I have on that one. The care program is out of Memphis, Tennessee, and this is a partnership between the Memphis Police Department, Memphis Fire, and Alliance Healthcare Services. And the Alliance Healthcare Services operates a crisis assessment center as part of a full service behavioral health provider. And they do everything from drug and alcohol treatment to initial intake and assessment, intensive outpatient services, uh, psychiatric screening and supported residential housing uh, programs. Their team includes a crisis trained officer, a paramedic and a social worker and 80% of the calls they handle without needing to call the ambulance or sending the person to jail. They truly try and focus on behavioral health emergencies the most, but they will take uh, a continuum of medical issues. And they're uh, Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, and then CAHOOTS program out of Eugene, Oregon. They're also associated with the White Bird Clinic, which is a nonprofit uh, agency there. They're contracted through the cities of Eugene and Springfield. Their operating budget is roughly 2.1 million annually. Again, probably the well, most well-known program. They were la launched in 1989, and they're uh, a coordinated care organization, but they also take private donors. They're also working with some other municipalities such as Olympia, Denver, Oakland, and New York to try and uh, get them to embark on a similar program. CAHOOTS responds via 911 dispatch 24 seven, but they can also be flagged down if they're out on the street. Most of the calls they take are related to addiction, mental health crisis, homelessness, and non-emergent medical issues. And their team includes a mental health crisis worker as well as a paramedic. They handled 17 to 20% of all the Eugene calls in 2018 and responded to 24,000 behavioral health calls in 2019. Uh, their estimated savings was, they felt they saved roughly 8 million uh, in the area of public safety and roughly 14 million for ambulance and emergency room treatment. Uh, they only recall, respond to calls that don't pose a danger to others. Uh, some calls require both police and cahoots to respond initially other times cahoots will call out police and other times police will call out cahoots. Uh, out of the 24,000 calls, uh, cahoots only ended up calling for police backup roughly 250 times, which was pretty impressive. Um, the, they refer people to the White Bird Clinic for psychological crisis assessment information, referral advocacy, wound treatment, uh, and now they even have a dental clinic, clinic that helps out. So what are some of the best practices needed for Flagstaff? Um, the alternate response model is, is great uh, and a great way to reduce the burden on police who do not have the expertise or the time to navigate the complicated behavioral health or substance abuse crisis systems. Um, unfortunately, the police are the only folks that are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week that people can call in crisis. 
But to truly be successful, we need to design an alternate response program that works for our community and has good aftercare resources. Um, and because most of our, the majority of our most vulnerable are Native American, I would highly recommend advocating for a resource or treatment center with Native American ties. And I'll talk about a couple of those here. Um, the Whitebird Clinic that Cahoots uses is a federally qualified health clinic and we could really benefit for something along those lines. It, as I told you earlier, it opened in 1969 as a grassroots flea, free clinic organized by student activists and concerned practitioners. It's open 24 hours, offers 24 hours crisis counseling service, outpatient drug and alcohol treatment, um, homeless case management, dental clinic, benefits enrollment, and mental health outreach in schools. But you can go ahead and advance the slide. Um, what's also cool is they took on teaching uh, mental health first aid to their community as well, um, which I thought was really neat. Um, the next program is called Native American Connections. And they're a little closer to us down in Phoenix. They have 21 sites that offer affordable housing, behavioral health and recovery assistance, uh, Native American healing, residential and outpatient services, youth services. Unfortunately, they are a physical structure. They don't have mobile response, but they take in intakes and referrals from several of the detox uh, agencies down in the valley and then people can also self-refer or they can take referrals from uh, providers such as Indian Health Services, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, etc. The next uh, place I thought would be really beneficial is a place called Friendship House and it's out of San Francisco. It's the oldest social service organization in the United States run by and for Native Americans. It's an 80 bed residential facility and people can enlist and stay there for up to six months. While they're there, they're immersed in both traditional cultural practices and Western approaches for substance recovery and prevention. And over the last 50 years, they helped out more than 4,800 residential clients overcome substance abuse. And what's great is 90% of their clients were sober six months later, which is truly you don't see that very often in treatment centers. Um, and the gentleman that turned me on to this was quoted on the website saying, these are not simply clients, these are our relatives, our relations, and that's the approach they take to try and help get their family healed. Um, it was developed to help keep Native American people sober, but accepts non-Native participants as well. Uh, recovery includes prayers, medicine men, healing ceremonies, talking circles, and sweat lodges. Um, they really try and focus on the whole individual, not the one single issue that's being dealt with. Um, but, you know, con historical trauma, uh, all those simultaneous issues that people are dealing with. And what's also unique is the cost of the program is on a sliding scale. Uh, they do have some federal grants that will cover some treatment, um, but the sliding scale depends on the person's income. Um, referrals are made to a clinical team who set, then sets the person up for intake if they are an approved candidate. Um, and then currently they've got some extra COVID testing that they do prior to uh, accepting people. Clients are truly encouraged to stay up to a year after care during which they're provided life and job skills. Um, and again, I think the recruitment of one of these two outstanding organizations should be a goal of our next, uh, if we move forward with our indigenous commission, this would be an awesome project to get them involved in. I did ask them if they were willing to look at expand to Arizona. Um, she said they're currently trying to uh, expand their operations in San Francisco, but they spoke quite a bit about taking referrals through Indian Health Services. So even if we can't get them here, we may be able to make some referrals to their program. Okay, next slide, please. Now I'd like to tradition, 
transition and just talk briefly about uh, some of the police and fire data and kind of what we're looking at currently in-house for our community through the police department and fire department. On the data, so your police department answered 43,000 calls for service in 2019. Um, and then we broke these out and we discovered that roughly 2,500 were mental health, low end mental health calls. And by low end, I mean uh, mental subject or welfare check. This, These weren't the suicidal person getting ready to jump in front of a train or the person that already um, taken bad actions. We also looked at our lowest priority alcohol related calls. This would be like man down, subject passed out in the park or welfare check on somebody sleeping under a tree. So roughly the mental health calls would take, would account for 6% of our total 43,000 calls for service. And the lowest priority alcohol related calls would be 7%. Um, likely the alcohol related calls are higher um, it's just hard to drill down into that without reading every report. And for an example, we could get a report of an assault in progress and we get there and we, we handle the call and we arrest who needs to be arrested. And then we discover, you know, it is that they, they are uh, members of our street population that we're dealing with pretty regularly. That call gets put in as an assault. It doesn't necessarily get put in as an alcohol related assault. Um, but we believe that super user population, if you will, is likely more responsible for 20 to 30 percent of our total call load, assaults, disturbances, uh, robberies, domestic violence. And then I threw in there some numbers. So last year, um, your officers spent 480 hours at the hospital with 346 arrestees. And I just threw out a number of if we're paying our officers $50 an hour, which is their hourly rate plus ERES. It's the rough cost to the department and the city's 24,000 a year. So we are spending a lot of staff resources on this clientele uh, to try and get them the help they need. The fire department, they answered 14,750 911 calls for service in 2019. 18% of their calls were public intoxicant man down related responses. And to a lesser extent, 383 were the behavioral health type responses. So that gives you an idea of some of the data we're looking at currently. So the police department, our, our current path forward, what we're trying to do is we've been in discussions with our regional behavioral health authority and under that umbrella, the Crisis Response Network and Teros Crisis Response. And so the Crisis Response Network has agreed that they'd be willing to take our crisis calls of low, low non-emergency mental health calls, uh, screen those off. And how that will work is if the person calls dispatch, dispatch goes through their protocols, and then we'll ask the person, are you willing to talk to a crisis counselor on the crisis line? If they say yes, we can transfer that call to crisis line. The crisis line through discussions with them, they've been able to successfully resolve roughly 70% of the calls that come their direction. The 30% that they're unable to resolve, uh, they may request Teros respond. And Teros is a mobile response of uh, two mental health professionals that will go to the scene. And we currently use, uh, the public may not know this, but we currently use Teros now. Um, just we usually wait till the officer gets there and then the officer will see, if, is it a crime issue or is it a mental health issue? If it's a mental health issue, they'll call Teros. And Teros has come out to 317 of our calls over the last 12 months. Uh, their average response time for, for us is 15 minutes if they're not already on a call and 40 minutes on average if they're already on a call that they need to wrap up and then come to us. Um, we're scheduled to go live with those protocols here on November 2nd, as far as the Taros and the crisis line. The dispatching and alternate response team from fire is in the works. They will need to decide what that looks like or we could create a hybrid police and fire team. 
Um, if you go to the next slide, it'll kind of show what that looks like. So the fire department's looking at a future cart unit with different options. So one option could be a 24 hour firefighter EMT with a social behavioral health worker, or we could just look at an AM, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. firefighter, social behavioral health worker, or we could you know, make it a three-person team with a police department member that's got some advanced training, a behavioral health worker, the firefighter, EMT, or outsource um, the behavioral health component to a private company, and then just have a two-member city team of a firefighter, EMT, and a PD member. Um, and Flagstaff Fire is running the numbers on these. And it just made sense to put it under fire because they already have a medical director. So the transition to a behavioral health medical model would be smoother under their framework uh, than the police department. And so we may likely see this again in the form of a budget request. So next slide, please. So in closing, uh, alternate response models for both alcohol and mental health related calls would greatly benefit our citizens and our most vulnerable. Um, the substance issue alone would have the greatest impact on police and fire calls, as we can see from the data. But mental health, homelessness, and poverty all impact our emergency services. Um, Additionally, any mental or any alternate response model we get will not be successful unless we get some additional resources post triage, either a de detox center, a day center, or something that's a native based long term treatment program along with housing. That would be the best to ensure the success of any alternate uh, response model. And with that, I will take any questions or um, let you have further discussion. Thank you so much, Chief. Council? Council? Let's go ahead and take the public comment card. Hello? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Hi, my name is Ross Schaefer Altenbaugh, and I'm the executive director of Flagstaff Shelter Services. We are in an emergency shelter and also another partner opened in this community 24 hours a day, 365 days a week, a year, excuse me. As many of you know, FFS offers shelter full day service case management, benefits enrollment, behavioral and physical health services on property. All of our staff are trained in mental health first aid as well. Most importantly, we believe housing is the answer to many of these barriers. Our programs, as well as many other in town, offer the many offer the many services discussed in the best practices listed by interim chief Musselman. We also have outstanding and dynamic MOUs starting and developing with services like NACA in town. I am speaking tonight in response to the subject of policing in our community. As you may know, FSS works closely with Flagstaff Police Department in many ways. We are grateful for the response we, we get when a crisis happens at the shelter or a hotel. Of course, our work is, is interconnected. I'm commenting because of the disproportionate number of Black, Indigenous, as people of color affected by the decisions this group is hearing about today. I have concerns that because of the many people with barriers addressed in today's presentation also happen to be additionally those experiencing homelessness. I have concerns that citizens and community organizations have been largely left out of the communication on this process. While other community policing models may be highly effective, in our community. I have concerns that we have not even begun to understand the true issues our neighbors are facing here. 
how could we begin to find solutions without listening to the community, our service providers, or the people who are directly being affected? Vice Mayor Shimoni and I have the honor to meet weekly with an indigenous group of folks to discuss Sorry, these Ray. types of issues. Don't and the overarching theme from these groups is that the work should be driven by the people affected. Oh, she not ran in with you? Oh, they know she's that laying through the door. COVID folks right now through hotel practices, and there is a beautiful and deliberate connection between housing and health care. Our clients are literally healthier in housing, not just because of COVID or being COVID free, but the co located services provided. Blood pressure is down, diabetes. Ross, are you still there? Ross? Hello? Okay, Mayor, let's, seem to have lost her. let's go to the next of, um, public comment and then see if we can bring her back. All right, give me just a moment. Uh, Ross did call back. She is online now. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure what you heard and what you didn't hear. Um, I think the reality is that housing makes people healthier, and we should be putting our work and our engagement into housing solutions. I believe the work is bigger than diversion. It's bigger than budget lines. Lines, and I know that many of these folks can be difficult to work with, but it's a complex problem and we need complex solutions. I believe we have a diverse set of programs in this community already with solutions if allowed to the table, but more importantly, I know that we have a very diverse community of voices that need to be heard. I would kindly urge council and everyone to take a step back, assess who is in, in need in our community, and before programs and money is spent, let's get them to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Ms. Achenbaugh? Okay, thank you. I will get the next speaker on. Go ahead and begin. Go ahead and begin. Okay, thanks. Uh, dear Mayor and Council members, police officers patrol our streets, our public spaces, and are often the first people on the scene when there is a crime or disaster. For over 200 years, they have been our country's first responders. However, our approach to public safety has undermined trust within the BIPOC community. From early slave patrols to harassment and unlawful surveillance of civil rights activists to criminalization of people of color, the history is undeniable and it exists. Today, I express my outrage over harassment and deaths of people of color, black people specifically, at the hands of police officers. I urge the city of Flagstaff to con con excuse me, continue the conversations around police violence and systemic racial profiling. It's time to reimagine public safety and policing and hear the voices of our BIPOC community who have clearly declared enough is enough. They must have a seat at the table in these conversations. How will you invite them? Education and training is a great first step. I sincerely hope this will be followed by thoughtful examination of our city's resource allocations and continued research into alternate systems that build true public safety for all. Thank you for your work for all the citizens of Flagstaff. Christy Zeller. Thank you. Are there any comments for Ms. Zeller? Any questions? Okay, thank you. I'm gonna to go to Mr. Odegaard. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I really appreciate the comments by uh, Ross Altenbaugh, because um, right now I'm reading the books called The Man in the Dog Park, and I'm almost finished. I just got a few pages left. And and uh, you know, there's a lot of issues concerning homelessness and, and everything that surrounds it. And, you know, the biggest thing that the takeaway from reading that book is, as Ross had pointed out, is um, housing. Um, we need more housing um, that will really make the difference. And I'm, so I'm not real sure where to go with this right now. I'd like to hear from my colleagues. 
because um, uh, Ross made a, uh, some really good points about make sure you know we're hearing some of the voices in our community um, before we can, I think, move on uh, from here. So thank you, Mayor. Council. Ms. Whelan. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Interim Chief Musselman uh, for the wonderful presentation. A lot of information, a lot of work went into it. I'd like to thank you and your team for presenting it. I'd also like to thank um, Ross and Ms. Seller uh, for their comments. Uh, it's clear that we're standing at some turning points and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Uh, I believe after what I've heard was uh, we know what what individuals and organizations are doing uh, in in many areas in California, in Oregon, um, in Phoenix, in Mesa. I think it's time to know what we have here and how what we have here can be more into a, a program that will serve the needs of our diverse community. And I believe that the way of doing that is to have uh, community members or nonprofits organize uh, several meetings to discuss what and please to have police and fire sitting at those meetings to discuss again. I think uh, interim chief was very clear on on what he believed were the needs. We haven't heard from fire yet, but I'm sure uh, deputy chief you have um, um, or interim chief. I'm sorry, uh, spoken to fire. But it's time that all the parties get together, set up an action plan, and that we get into motion with this. Uh, we know what the missing pieces are. We know we, we're not sure if we need detox. We're not sure. Uh, we're certainly sure about housing as being an essential piece, but we also need to make sure our cultural needs are being met. Um, and who can best meet those here and, and now. Uh, so I believe that the next piece should be that formation of the people who are working on the front line. And with this information, with the police and fire together to come up with an action plan as to what would fit our community. So thank you all for all your hard work. Um, and I sure do appreciate everyone who, who uh, wants to work hard for our community in this manner. So thank you. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, while I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time, this has been a very big topic on my mind for many years, but as of more recently, you know, knowing that this conversation is on the horizon, um, I've been looking forward to this meeting specifically. So I'm so glad that we're here now and having this conversation. And, and, and Chief Musselman, thank you for your presentation. I think that that information you shared was on points and very relevant and very important for us to move to use moving forward. Um, I want to start by saying that the way I'm looking at this is is not just through the lens of, of numbers and and costs and and price but really changing that narrative to looking at the individual you know we, we often look at these individuals as as data points how many times are they utilizing our police department or our hospital or our jail how many nights are they staying what's the cost but at the end of the day these are individuals these are family members to our community and 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 we need to start looking at it at a more holistic from a more holistic approach 
of just humanity and the well-being of our community. And in the end, by taking care of our community, uh, it's going to save us a lot of money. That's just a fact. The data shows that time and time again. And, and a lot of times, you know, beneath the, the substance is trauma, it's abuse, it's, it's, it's mental health. There's underlying concerns. So the response alone to 911 calls is just one piece of the puzzle. And I'm not going to get off, get us off too, too off track on this topic, but I just wanted to share the way I'm looking at it, Council, and to those watching this video is there's four pieces. First one is how we respond to 911 calls. The second one is th where are we taking them once we, we, you know, we're responding to a call? Are we going to the hospital? Are we going to the jail? Or is there somewhere we can divert folks to, like a detox center or something that we, we put together? Um, third thing is getting them into services, getting them into programs like the Front Door and, and Catholic Charities and NARBA and programs that get them into housing with wraparound services. Because the data also shows once we get them into housing with amazing wraparound services of which our community is providing, they're often not going to get back on a negative track, on a bad track. They're going to keep on a positive track. And it's a lot easier to get them to a place where they're doing good when they're in housing. And the front door waiting list, from my understanding, is pretty darn big currently. And so housing is healthcare. And I know Ross, who is listening, will appreciate to hear me say that. And, and we really need to figure out a plan to address that housing need. Um, <clears throat> after that is what I call the zero, step zero. So step four is really kind of step zero, which is pr proactive efforts and, and kind of, you know, creating, like going on, the, walking the streets, walking the parks, building the relationships, building that trust between, you know, our service providers and those in need. And so what I'm promoting, Council, and proposing we do is we definitely look at reestablishing the CART program. Um, so still, I still think we can come up with a better name for that. And I'd love to have um, Fire Chief Gaylord speak a little bit about this, the CART program. But that CART program, basically being a firefighter, EMT, partnered with a mental health social worker, maybe a partnership with the Guidance Center, and, and then responding through a van to calls. Um, is that 24-7? Is it, you know, 8 to 8? I'm not too sure, but um, we can talk more about that later. And that will also respond to 911 calls. So there goes, you know, the response piece. And then they can also be proactively walking the neighborhoods and parks to best assist an individual by empowering them to um, seek help and, and seek services. You know, at the end of the day, the individual needs to make the choice themselves to change. And, and so all we can do is empower and support. Um, and then let's see. And in terms of the detox location or somewhere to take someone other than, you know, taking them to the hospital or to the jail, um, we can talk more about that. But for the sake of tonight, I think, you know, it's really about response. And then in terms of permanent supportive housing, yes, we need to bring Native American connections to Flagstaff. Um, that's something we've been working on or I've been working on with other members of the community for a while now. And we need to keep having that conversation and, and other build upon that kind of support. But then we have great partners like NACA, of which the shelter is partnering with currently to better support our indigenous relatives here in Flagstaff who are unsheltered. And so um, lots of good things in the, in the, you know, happening in the community. But, uh, and then with Taros, obviously, as Chief mentioned, you know, with the crisis line going live, taking on more calls as of November 2nd, that's a huge first step. You know, is that taking on a big number of 911 calls? Um, no, it's not, but it's a step. But th what Taros is, is lacking is an EMT. So that's where the CART program comes in. And so we can maximize our partnerships with efforts like Taros, but we need to build something like the CART, in my opinion. We need to get that going again. So um, I'll just close by kind of passing the mic over to Chief Gaylord. If you're on the call, I'd love to have you maybe talk for a couple of minutes about the CART and what you think we can do moving forward. Good evening, everybody. Uh, nice job by uh, the uh, police chief. Uh, we collaborated uh, 
with Chief Musselman and his team and, and uh, a very nice job putting uh, the options together. The fire department's been working since about September of last year, uh, looking for a better model. What, what we have recognized is that as our um, two call volume increases uh, for true medical emergencies, we find ourselves kind of competing for resources for non-emergent type responses. And as you saw, approaching 20% of which are um, which are public intoxicant calls and another small fraction of that that are identifiable as mental health emergencies, um, which we understand that the larger uh, the larger population that we serve uh, that um, that present as public intoxicants, many of them have other issues that up to and including mental health issues. So, uh, we be began collaborating with mental health professionals and, and really, um, really understand and, and now have a greater appreciation for the fact that um, we need to send a different type of response. Uh, we, we do feel like we need a, a what we call an EMT level or BLS level response. Um, we think that's an important, quite honestly, a very important um, a piece of a response that allows us the flexibility to team up with a, a, a behavioral health specialist and work in the behavioral health arena with uh, the ability to provide these citizens with the type of assistance that they need. Um, I've got a talented a bunch of men and women um, who are passionate about providing care, but they're just the wrong tool for so much of uh, the kinds of uh, calls that we're talking about this evening. Um, so we're we're uh, definitely um, pursuing ideas. Uh, we actually have already applied for a grant, and uh, we're not and rarely, uh, I'll say that in a rare form of uh, not being successful in a grant. Uh, we weren't uh, on our first run at a grant to help us uh, implement a different type of alternative response. Uh, and Chief Musselman, in, in our research on uh, programs and successes around uh, the country, absolutely there is always a, a, a facility that lends itself to receiving these types of, of uh, um, patients and, and folks that we see out in the community. We lack options in our community. Uh, that uh, we we simply don't have the kinds of receiving locations that can be a destination uh, for uh, these types of folks in need and or um, provide long-term type of care and options. Uh, so that's where I think police and fire are all trying to do uh, right now our, our very best at trying to find a better response. I mean, this is an an important population in the community, and we just have we're recognizing that we need a place to to um, take these uh, these members of our community, and we absolutely need to send a different type of response, particularly as it impacts the 911 system. I can answer any specific questions that you might have uh, on on the fire department's uh, efforts, uh, and uh, again, thanks to Chief Musselman for a nice job and presenting all the information. Chief Gaylord, I'm gonna put you on the spot for a minute and ask you a question. Um, you know, we had the CART in the past. How can we make it so that it's a it's a position at, let's say if, if council majority agrees that we should do this with the fire department locally, how do we make it that that team through fire is really wanting to be part of that team? How do we make, set it up in a way that for it to, for it to succeed? I think that um, what we have uh, learned from our experiences, it was uh, difficult for us to sustain um, the the medical component. Uh, we also, um, you know, we tried part time. Part time was very difficult to sustain um, because the kind of people that we are attracted uh, or who are attracted to those jobs, they're looking for work as firefighters, um, and so. Our model, our way of thinking now is we integrate and we put cross-trained firefighter EMTs on this and we integrate them uh, into our workforce and they they rotate through and work with the mental health 
professional uh, who is a civilian mental health professional that's highly trained and can assist us in meeting the needs of uh, this part of our community. So it's uh, we tried part-time and we also tried uh, part-time, very unsustainable, um, if you will, almost a uh, almost a revolving door from a staff perspective and difficult for us to recruit, uh, train, and maintain a workforce that's kind of focused on that activity. Our discussions with mental health professionals are, um, that should have been a big clue for us because this is what mental health, behavioral health professionals this is where they want to go to work uh, and they want to um, receive and they want to provide this level of service because they're equipped to do so. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to go to um, Mr. Mr. Odegaard, I believe. Uh, no, Mayor. Actually, it was Councilmember McCarthy who was before me. Okay. I was like, wait a minute. Okay, there'll be Mr. McCarthy, Mr. Odegaard, and then Ms. Willen. Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, I think tonight, uh, both from you know, the police and especially from Mr. Musselman, we've got a pretty good overview. It sounds like there's actually a consensus, at least amongst the uh, fire and, and police people, that we do need to make some changes. So I guess my comment ties into Ms. Whelan's comment that, okay, that's great. Now we need to go do something. I don't know if we need to set up sort of an ad hoc committee between the police, the fire, and maybe some council people and other staff people and see how we can implement some of this. And of course, an important part of it is, you know, the monetary part of it. Uh, will we, will we be saving some money in the police and fire area that we can use in these new areas, or does it have to be all new funding? And so, and then what are the funding sources? Is it the general fund? Is it, uh, are there grants available? And so it's kind of a big project, but uh, it's, I get the impression at least that there's a consensus that uh, something needs to be done and we can improve the efficiency of, our police, our fire, and and improve actually improve the care for the people that need it the most. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Odegaard. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And and again, um, thank you to Mr. Musselman and all the work that's gone into this presentation is very good. Um, I do have a question for our city manager because um, this has been a topic for quite a while. I know there was a big effort. Um, by some of my colleagues and and also from Coconino County or, um, or other, uh, I guess, public agency of traveling to Florida and, and looking at something. And so this has been on kind of on everyone's radar for a very long time. And uh, so I asked um, the city manager, uh, Mr. Clifton, um, since this has been a discussion, has there been any effort to actually um, try to put something in place to kind of get us moving in a forward direction? Um, I know you and I had our discussions on this uh, last month um, during September in our monthly meeting about now is kind of the time to act and to move us forward on this issue. So I'd like to hear from Mr. Clifton. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Odegaard. I mean, it's a very, I, I think, relevant question. Um, this has been uh, a topic that has been on the table for, for quite some time, uh, greatly uh, preceding my arrival at the city. It gets talked about in many circles, including the CJCC and, and others. Uh, and yes, there has been, uh, you know, careful review of, of including site visits of other models used in other jurisdictions. Um, I believe uh, it's really important that we uh, see the discussions uh, quickly evolve into action on, on this. And I know there uh, will be significant budgetary discussions to go along with it, partnership discussions, grant opportunities, and yes, the inclusion of uh, some of the existing nonprofit services that, that can 
assist. I don't, I don't think any of the models that have been talked about this evening are ones that are entirely premised upon a singular entity's uh, uh, oversight or involvement, but rather a very collective partnership um, spanning the spectrum of services, needed services. But uh, that is my immediate comment, council member, is uh, I do think it is time to move forward and uh, inviting more discussion on this as inclusive and comprehensive as it will be, um, I, I fear is just going to prolong the discussion. And uh, I, I can't help but harken back to that one evening in June when we had in the area of 500 public comments. Of course, this was in the height of, of a, a very strong awareness movement on, in, with regard to Black Lives Matter. Um, many of those discussions that evening, as council will likely recall, uh, were kind of directed either at this uh, issue uh, literally or indirectly. Um, I mean, they, they were uh, in, involving this topic of taking uh, much of, of the responses uh, to these um, types of calls that, that come in out of the hands of police officers and having a different approach. We heard that uh, so frequently uh, throughout that evening and uh, there has been a lot of discussion internally on, on that uh, in the months subsequent, uh, which has led to this discussion tonight. So I do think this discussion tonight was intended to be a platform from which we might be seeking some uh, action steps. Uh, and I, that's not to say that we are done with the discussion by any means, but it is to suggest uh, that I think that the time is at hand for us to talk about action measures uh, as, as next steps. Um, the last thing I'll comment is we, we haven't gained ground uh, on this uh, issue. I, I think there's a lot of great services being provided by many great uh, service providers, uh, nonprofit organizations, churches, uh, service organizations in this community. Um, but we, uh, we continue to see the, the social issues that we're, we're talking about. And, and so... Uh, at least with respect to the narrow topic of how do we lessen the burden on law enforcement and see it, an alternative response program, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, this discussion will, will lead to some possible action steps. Thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, City Manager. And also, uh, you know, I like to see this as a multi-prong approach uh, to the issue, uh, you know, going back to housing. Um, you know, we have some opportunities, we have some assets that maybe we can do uh, better at in providing more housing. And so I think we just need to be all inclusive as we move forward. So thank you, city manager. Um, Ms. Whelan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Chief. Before I, I start speaking, could you tell me, um, what I heard you say, and just for clarification, was that firefighters, part of the CARP program, uh, might not have been working because firefighters want to be firefighters. And even though they have EMT training, which I believe most of our firefighters do, uh, that's really not why they came into the police department. But I also heard in your solution, I think, was to have a firefighter EMT on the cart. And I'm just wondering what your thinking is around that. So yes, Council Member Whelan, I'll, I, I'm not sure if you were directing that towards the fire chief or myself, it, but I'll do my best can, to. Yeah, it can go to both of you. I know you all have collaborated, so whoever feels so the thought of having a firefighter EMT with us is so, so they can treat medical injuries, wounds, um, such as if the person's got a, a busted you know, nose, leg, or something that needs advanced medical care, which I don't think the clinician technically has expertise in that area. I also think it helps police and fire to be there together because then you can kind of triage the call and decide, well, is this more of a police call? Is it more of a medical call? 
uh, no, neither of us should be here. This is a mental health call. Let's call on the experts. The right tool at the right time for the right reason. And I'll turn it over to the fire chief to expand if he wishes. Thank you, Chief. Councilmember Whalen, I yes. will add that I hope I wasn't confusing. So the, the part-time model of EMTs that we tried uh, in our previous alternative response uh, were non-firefighter uh, cross-trained individuals. They were EMT only. Uh, and then we tried full-time EMTs uh, and paramedics and um, that did not um, work out well from a sustainability of the workforce um, because as, as I mentioned, what, I, what I'd hoped to convey was they were looking for full-time employment in, in the, the cross-disciplined, uh, cross-trained firefighter, uniform firefighter field. Uh, and so our idea here is that we bring uh, the cross-trained EMT firefighter into an, an alternative response that includes a behavioral health specialist. And we integrate that EMT function into the, uh, the fire department. And that becomes something of a rotational uh, opportunity. And in that rotation, then um, we, we also, with our work with an on-staff behavioral health specialist, we also become across the board better at responding to the needs of our community in behavioral health. So I'd hope to say that. I probably didn't do a very good job of saying that earlier, but I hope that's clarity. That is clarity, and I'd like to thank you. Okay, I'd like to go ahead and go to Mr. Aslan. Um, Mayor? Are you finished? No. Okay. I'm sorry, I muted myself. I, I would like to uh, again stay, say that, that we've got amazing ideas here and amazing collaboration. And I understand, Vice Mayor, you've worked very hard on this. But to shift in a, to a solution or an action, in my opinion, without the collaboration between uh, members of the county, NACA, the shelter, TGC, the hospital, Terrace, everyone sitting down with police, fire, community members, city staff, and even a council member does not make sense to me. We need to do that. We need to, that group needs to make the action plan, what fits for the, the, the city and its community members, and then come back to council and figure out how we're gonna pay for it. So once again, I think that piece is essential, essential in the solution. Thank you, Mayor, I'm done. <laughs> I'm going to go to Mr. Aslan first, then I'm going to speak, and then I'll go back to the Vice Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to both Chiefs for your input tonight and um, for your thoughtful uh, attention to these presentations. Um, so just got a lot of thoughts swirling around here. A lot of them have been shared by others, so I'll try not to be too repetitive. Um, I do have a couple things though. I wanted to ask, uh, well, okay, so just in general, I'm very excited that we're all talking about, you know, let's do something. Um, I'm still a little bit hesitant and confused as to exactly what that is. Uh, you know, I, I think it is time that we need to take action. I personally don't feel qualified to prescribe what action that is. And while I love your enthusiasm, Adam, about CART, I just, I don't know that I'm ready tonight um, to throw down a one out of seven vote on something so specific at this juncture. Um, so that's just where I'm, I'm at. And if, if other people are not as hesitant, then that will cue me um, to being a bit more enthusiastic about, uh, you know, choosing something. But uh, in terms of, you know, what Councilmember Wayland just said about laying the groundwork, 
Uh, my major question was kind of related to that. I was wondering, Chief Musselman, if you could talk for just a moment about the conversations uh, that you're having, if any, already with um, you know the local NACA or any other Navajo Nation social service groups. Um, I, I know you guys have relationships, but are, are there conversations going around specifically about alternative policing and um, the conduits that we're gonna be putting in place to make those things happen? Um, our staff, our social service providers and their staff members being specifically identified as people that will be plugged into these things? Or are we just way, is that, is that still pretty far down the road? Thanks for the question, council member. We are having conversations internally um, to discuss what we feel this should look like, what, um, where we could get our best return on investment. And some of those um, themes I've tried to bring out is specifically having a Native American centered treatment or housing function, having a detox, having a day center, um, I have met with various previous, previously, uh, you know, beyond a year ago, I met with Flagstaff Shelter Services. I talked about the day center program with Ross. Um, I talked about diverting intoxicants and Ross is a great partner, um, but I, I agree. I don't want to take somebody to her shelter that's so intoxicated, they're going to start a fight and get her staff hurt. So some of those lower I should say some of the minimal conversations have been had at that level. They've also taken place with some of our justice partners through the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. Um, but it's it's one of those things. We've been talking about this for decades. I mean, this was a topic when I first got hired 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and we've tried some things here and we've tried some things there and they didn't work and they didn't work um, or they didn't work as well as we would have liked. And, and the national narrative is happening. So I, I think we need to strike while the iron is hot and move yeah. forward. And I'm fine with, you know, including whoever we want to include in the conversation. But sometimes you get so many people involved, it just it <laughs> bogs it down. Uh -huh. uh, so I, I hope I answered your question. Well, I, I mean, generally, yeah, it's I, I, obviously you guys are in relationship with some of these service providers and it's it's hard for you to get too specific without um, having marching orders. Uh, and I guess that's going to be coming from us. Um, so anyway, I, Mayor Evans, maybe you're going to kind of tie this all up in a nice little bow here in a second, um, something you're very good at doing. Uh, but, you know, I, I, what I sense is that we're all we're all ready for this. The iron is definitely hot. We're in a national moment where we can take advantage of and leverage uh, a real mandate to get this done finally, even though folks have recognized the need for it for a long time. Um, I just don't know specifically what that's going to look like. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to take too much time doing too much research, but, uh, you know, so what do we do? <laughs> So I'm happy that you asked that, Mr. Aslan. Um, I really wanted council to really have the conversation. Um, I see that Ms. Um, Salas liked to um, jump in, but I want to go ahead and just try to um, at least put down some thoughts that I have. Okay. Um, you know, Chief Musselman just said that this has been an issue or this has been a topic of discussion um, for a very long time. I know I've been on council since 2008, and we've been having this conversation since 2008. No, right now, um, you know, we're having this conversation because of the events from the summer. But, you know, a couple of years ago, we were having the conversation about something else that happened then. And before that, we were having the conversation about stuff that happened before then. This has been an ongoing conversation. Over the years, we've had the continuum of care. We've had uh, the CJCC. We have had, um, there was a partnership between the Flagstaff Medical Center, the county, um, I think the Guidance Center, uh, Navajo Nation, uh, there has been numerous different groups that have come and gone and are still meeting, discussing, looking, and trying to figure out what to do about the problem. Um, but in the meanwhile, um, we still have an issue. And then what happens is because we have the issue and because it's not being addressed, 
we end up in, again, conversations like these where people are um, talking about whether or not we are profiling, whether or not we are unnecessarily incarcerating people who are um, Black or Indigenous um, or other people of color. And we keep having these conversations because we never get to really what the root issue is. I think it's very interesting that we are saying that the root is issue is housing and housing is health care. And, you know, I got to just point it out that every single time housing comes before this council, there's not a political will to do something meaningful and directly about it. I just want to just put that out there. I'm sure there'll be disagreement on that. But I go every single time we have something about housing, it seems as if we can't necessarily could get complete the project. So I'm sitting here listening to this conversation. I'm like, hmm, we need some halfway houses. We need a detox center. And I wonder where we would actually install those where there would not be a NIMBY issue, because that's what this community needs. Um, now, moving forward, I think that there's a couple of things that we can do. Definitely, we can continue to have conversations and we can invite as many people to the table as possible, and we should, right? But we have an immediate issue that needs to be dealt with. It needs to be dealt with because, one, it's the humane thing to do. Two, it's the correct thing to do. And three, it's going to assist um, with really having a discussion about why are people incarcerated, right? Because we talk about the fact that, you know, the police are arresting people and taking them to jail, but we never get to the root cause of why people are being arrested and taken to jail. I think if we come up with an alternative response model, then it will shift from what the police are doing to why is it we have this alternative response model why is it that we're expending money on that? And is it addressing the root cause? Right now, we can't get to that conversation because it's the police officers who are acting as the first responders when it comes to detox, when it comes to mental health, when it comes to physical health, when it comes to all of that stuff. So I think that we need to move forward with one of these programs. Now, um, in my world, or in the world of community, um, I guess, organizations or community organizing, there's something called a rapid assessment response and evaluation. This is a model that was designed by Dr. Miguel Vasquez and another doctor at NAU that's been used for over 30 years. It's used to address um, social health issues on the ground, right? So you go in, you do a rapid assessment, you respond to it, and then you do an evaluation on that response to find out if the response is working. We have actually used that here in Flagstaff four different times now to address issues in the community. This is the model that they used in New York City when they were having an issue with the rise of HIV. And this is something, this model is used internationally. You know, I would really suggest one, that we allow the chiefs, the two chiefs, you know, Chief Musselman and Chief Gaylord, who have given us pretty clear about what they think they need to help address the issue from their lens, right? we need to do something to support one of these models that they're talking about. Number two, if we want to pull together yet another community group to have a conversation about this, I would suggest that we actually bring in NAU and we bring in all of the other people that want to be a part of this conversation and that we do a, a, a rare, it's called a rare, rapid assessment response and evaluation, right? And have NAU as a partner because they have the ability to do this because this was designed over there, right? And then what happens with that is you get to you, you talk to the people who are directly impacted because people who are impacted by things, they know what they need to be successful. Okay. And then the next step that we need to do is we need to, so we've, we've done the immediate, which is what our officers and police officers, or excuse me, our fire and police need. Right. So we've shifted the focus to what it is. What is actually the underlying issue as to why we have the situation? We have an immediate response to try to better the conditions. You do a, you, you have this community group, this community group does a rare where they get to the bottom of it, you know, and that comes down to the community's part in all of this, right? The community organizations and the people in the community. You know, we still have people who are perhaps selling um, um, alcohol to people that they really shouldn't be, but they don't understand what that does to the community. We still have people who don't want certain houses and don't want certain people in their neighborhood. This will help address that. Right, so that's like the the the, the midterm goal. The long term goal is to actually address the situation in a meaningful way, where we don't have it, or we minimize um, the impacts of it. I think that's extremely important, and that's going to also include the fact that we need a detox center here in Flagstaff. We also need to have funders, though. 
right? We need to have people that not only help fund the detox center, but help fund all of these organizations. You know, we mentioned the front door and what uh, Ross is doing over at Flagstaff Shelter Services. That is phenomenal. Each and every year they struggled to get the funding to make sure that they can deliver these programs. So there's also those components, right? So that is my recommendation, is that we actually do something and not just talk about it. I think what we do would help shift the conversation from police, 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 and to what is the actual underlying root cause of homelessness, of mental health problems, of um, substance abuse problems, and let's actually start talking about that in a meaningful way so we can address those. So that's my recommendation. Ms. Salas. Actually, I'm going to go to the vice mayor first, and then I see Ms. Salas. Thank you, Mayor. And, and, and you know, just to let council know, I, I totally agree with the idea of going to the public and, and to our community partners. Uh, I am part of the CJCC group and have also recently joined one of the CJCC subcommittee groups I've met earlier today. And um, they were saying that, you know, they'd be happy to help out and be part of this process as well. So I, I do think that, you know, those of us who have been part of the conversation and this conversation for, for Mayor, not as long as you, uh, myself, but years, this conversation has been taking place. Um, we're ready, right? We're at the table. We're ready to go. We're chomping at the bit to get to get going and make this happen. But I do think that, you know, I, I agree with Councilmember Solis and Ms. Um, sorry, Ms. Whelan and yourself and others who have spoken about going to the public. But um, I like to think that we can um, move forward with some things um, and that that being just the CARP program specifically. And maybe that's just part of the outreach and, and I'm fine either way. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, we need to do things through a culturally sensitive lens because there's a lot of folks that have lost trust in our systems, whether it's government, whether it's um, policing, whatever it might be, they've lost trust in our models and they don't, um, they don't buy in, they just don't have the buy-in. So we need to really make sure we do it right the first time. And to do that, we need to build that community trust and buy-in. And that's why I think I hear all of you um, saying is that you wanna engage with the public and, and Ross said that on her public comments. And I fully agree. And that was one bullet point I forgot to mention in my first public comment myself. Um, so so I do think that the CART is something we all agree on. You know, a, an alternate response to 911 calls, um, I think is something we could potentially move forward with tonight. But um, like I said, I'm happy to, to wait for that community conversation and, and then and then, yeah, collaborate with the community partners and the and, and mayor, as you said, talking to those who are the ones that are receiving these services is crucial. And and knowing who they are, how many people are we looking at to support and what are their needs? I think that's extremely important that we understand that before we move forward with the plan to make sure we're best, we're, we're putting forward our best foot. And so I think that's a good idea. And And then I think that we need to come up with a holistic and strategic plan to addressing the list that is on the front door waiting list. You know, there's hundreds of individuals and families waiting to get into housing. And, and Mayor, I, I hear you. And I think we need to be talking to developers, not just those that need a rezone, but developers who are building in our community and seeing what kind of partnerships we can put into place to get housing at you know, a rate of which the front door can partner with and get people into housing. And then we probably will have to support agencies and, and have partnerships with Catholic charities to help them provide that wraparound services and that social worker. Because a lot of times people really need that, that wraparound service. Um, and that at the end of the day will address the needs of our um, community's well-beings in my opinion. Thank you. So I just wanna circle back and say Vice Mayor, I'm not saying that we need the CART program because I'm not sure that that's what I heard the chief saying that we need, right? What I think I heard the chief saying that we need is we need to support one of these programs, one of these alternative response models that's on this, um, that's on our screen right now. Now, if for some reason the chiefs are saying, yeah, the CART program, if we instituted it, uh, reinstituted it tomorrow is what we need, then that's what I'm willing to go with. But I'm not sure that I heard the chief say that. So I just want to stop real quick and just say that what I heard the chief say is that we, needed, we need an alternative response program now. 
I'm not sure that they said they wanted the cart or they needed the cart, but I think they were talking about something that's broader. So perhaps we need to ask for clarification. Number two, when it comes to housing, it's wonderful and great that we can go and talk to developers and we can ask the developers to do affordable housing. Here in the state of Arizona, they are not required to do that. What council has direct control over is things like city owned property. And what council could do is have the political will to go ahead and build on their property for housing. And so I just wanna make sure that we're clear about what I was saying. I think it's great that we can go talk to other people, but we actually have stuff in our control that we are not doing. And when you talk about this housing for this population of people, some of the things that we need, we need um, halfway houses. We need a detox center. We can't even build, or there's not even a council will to build workforce housing for police officers, nurses, and teachers. So I just wanna make sure that I'm clear that what you're talking about when it comes to housing is going to be an even more difficult lift if council doesn't have the political will to do the lift for people that are not in this population. Okay? Right. So I'm right. gonna go ahead. Really quick, Mayor, I just wanna say that the CAHOOTS program is very much the same as our CART, what the CART used to be. Thank you. Okay, well, there you go. Thank you for clarifying that for me. Uh, we're gonna go to uh, Ms. Salas. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, I pretty much echo your your perspective. Um, also, bringing uh, focus on our role as council with respect to our uh, authority and um, locus of control, meaning what we can do for our police and uh, fire departments with respect to alternative response model for both alcohol and mental health related calls. So I am really relying on the recommendations of our chiefs moving forward with that alternative response model and um, also move that forward uh, as we develop our budget for next year. So that's step one. Step two, uh, with regards to um, our locus of control in terms of uh, sphere of influence, when it comes to um, addressing the substance abuse issues, um, mental health, homelessness, and poverty, you know, I have repeatedly heard that, you know, the, the need for post-triage uh, services, such as the detox center, day shelter, and native-based long-term programs and housing. So I, th I, am, I am here to, to, to take action to in whatever way I can in reaching out to stakeholder pa and partners not only in Flagstaff, but throughout the region, especially with the county and the, the, the tribal nations, uh, specifically the the Tupa, Cell, the Tupa City Regional Health Center, and they have a hospital here, right here in Flagstaff, which is the Sacred uh, Peak Center on 89 and North County Healthcare, along with reaching out to um, the tribal leaders uh, and figure out uh, a way to coalesce, collaborate, and uh, embark on that rare assessment that the mayor has has uh, eloquently articulated. So uh, let's do it. Thank you. Ms. Whelan. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for what you said. Uh, to the point, and you're you're a gifted speaker that way. Um, I I I'm not sure if you had this piece, but one of the pieces seems to be our collection of data. Um, so I think that's going to be a very important piece as we work for the solution. The other piece, and I I believe I've heard it mentioned, but not with with clarity is the idea of um, is, 
you know, and I, I heard it from uh, our public speakers um, before or when the meeting started, but we really need to have the conversation. For example, public intoxicants, is that against the law? And if it's not against the law, why are we having the responses that we're having? And and I think this 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 kind of burrows into that much larger philosophical um, discussion. Uh, addiction, alcoholism is a disease model. Period. End of story. I heard someone mentioned that it was a choice. Sobriety is the choice, uh, but addiction is not the choice. So there needs to be people in on this conversation that have that expertise. We need to get the correct data in order to make sure we are moving forward in a positive direction. And we really need to check um, you know, our site and release policies and, and be very specific about them. And we also need to have that discussion. If uh, public intoxication is not against the law, why are people being picked up or cited and released? So I get that we could throw that under trespassing. We could also throw it under other things, but I mean, that's part of the discussion. So thanks for listening. I appreciate it. And I think what I'm hearing, Ms. Whelan, is that I don't hear that that discussion is not, not wanted. And I hear that people want to have that discussion. I think I heard council saying that that discussion is needed. But I also think what I hear, and I'm not sure what's on the screen right now, but I don't think it should be, um, what I also hear is that we need to do something now, right? That that discussion has been one that has been ongoing for at least Understood. 20 years in our community. Understood. And so, you know, one of the things about our community is it's that it's transit. So it seems like every five years we have a whole new group of people that come in and whatever plans or whatever thoughts and ideas that we might be working on, you know, the new group of people want to be involved, rightfully so, and they want to put their stamp on it. What I hear though tonight is that that can definitely happen and that should happen and it needs to happen. However, we need to do something now while we are having that conversation. And what can we do now that may or may not be permanent, right? Because this group might have a conversation and there might be something new, different or something better we should be doing. Well, that can be folded into what it is that the city is doing to address what the city has control of or it can be something that augments what the city is doing, or it can be an enhancement or addition to. That's really how I hear this conversation. It's not an all or nothing thing. It's Got like, it. what can we do now? And then what can we also be doing at the same time to really address the long-term impacts? Understood and agreed. So I'm gonna to go to the city manager and I'm gonna be Mr. City Manager. What did you hear? Did you hear a consensus there or do we need to continue the conversation? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Council, for uh, a very meaningful discussion. And I would agree the presentation was great. It queued this conversation up nicely. There may be some emerging consensus, Mayor, but uh, to be direct, I'm feeling, uh, you, you know, we th this is a work session item and it's a very important item. One of the most important ones we put on your agenda in some time. They're all important, but this one is, is makes the short list. Uh, very likely, uh, we should be coming back to you. Uh, there should be a continued discussion, but with a little more refinement. So um, if the consensus from council is that, yes, we need action, and, and I would be grateful to hear that, as I know our interim chief would and many at the staff level, uh, maybe the next discussion is uh, to hone that down further. What does the action look like? Who would the stakeholders uh, be? And you know what? And, and slowly we gravitate toward next steps. I don't think it was a realistic outcome to this presentation today that we would have um, the action steps all lined up, but rather the start of a, a discussion that probably will span a couple 
two or three meetings uh, with council. And yes, it, it should definitely in, include other uh, stakeholders as well. Um, but I'm hoping that's the consensus that I'm hearing is that uh, there is a desire to move forward and move forward with action oriented steps. Thank you. So do you need council to go around and say, yes, we want to do one of these alternative response programs? Or perhaps a combination of the programs, but maybe yes, uh, we come back to council with uh, a preferred alternative and continue the discussion. I don't know that we're at a point where we feel like we can run with the ball. I, I think there needs to be a little more discussion with the council. Okay, so rather than me press the council on their alternative, your suggestion is that we come back again to council and we narrow the focus on which alternative response program. Yes, and if there are some uh, direct, or pardon me, some uh, items of what has been presented to you tonight that council is uh, gravitating toward, it would be good to, to hear that. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that there are, but th there's been a lot of good ideas exchanged. So, council, I'm going to go back to each one of you. Like, um, if you could just sum it up in like 30 seconds to 45 seconds as to, um, you know, really what you think. That would be extremely helpful. I'm going to start with the vice mayor because I think he knows. And then if we could follow his example of short and sweet, that would be helpful. <laughs> oh, I, I know. That's for sure. I know what I know. Anyways, um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of good alternatives that we've looked at. But I think the best thing we can do is, is reestablish our CART program and figure out the best plan to make it successful, which is very much a CAHOOTS model but through our fire department with hopefully a partnership with the guidance center or another community partner like that. Um, I think that'd be a great first step. And Mayor, I fully agree with your, your idea of, of doing that assessment of those who, and talking to those who um, are gonna be seeking the services as Ross mentioned too, and, and really doing that on the ground outreach. And then as city manager mentioned, um, um, working to figure out next steps and, and what partners we need to bring to the table and what conversations need to be had. And and that's, I think, my two cents. Thank you. Mr. Aslan? Uh, come back to me in a second. Sorry. Mr. McCarthy? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I don't have a specific recommendation amongst the uh, alternatives that we've been given, but I definitely support the idea of moving forward with this and uh, hopefully staff will come back to us with some recommendations that we can uh, have another discussion on. But I'm very supportive of the idea that we do need to make some changes. I think it'll help the community. I think it'll help our relationship with the community. And I think it will actually help the police department and the fire department to be more efficient. So uh, there's, there's where I'm at. Thank you. Mr. Odegaard? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, um, you know, really, I would like to, you know, get to maybe a, one or two recommendations from um, from what the presentation was tonight. But first, you know, um, make sure um, we have the conversations with all our partners um, that this from there's a consensus as uh, Council Member Whelan has um, stated before is just try to get everybody on agreement as because as you said mayor uh, we've tried a lot of things um, some most have not worked for whatever reason or maybe didn't work as well as we'd like it to see um, but I want to make sure the recommendations that will come forward to us of actionable items are recommendations that the consensus is that will be of success. And and I would like to see something come back to us uh, fairly quickly um, when feasible, um, you know, within the next month or so, if that's doable. Um, so that's my thoughts. So thank you. Ms. Salas. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, yeah, I am in full support of uh, an immediate program for alternative um, response. Uh, 
and I will rely on our fire and, and police uh, chiefs to put forth some recommendation, uh, keeping in mind uh, addressing um, addiction, mental health, homelessness, and other issues, and also keeping in mind uh, uh, a program that will that is suitable to our community um, and with strong Native American connections. Thank you. Elin. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I believe you brought up uh, a three-pronged approach, which I would agree with, and and uh, perhaps staff can come back with a present, midterm, long-term plan, and that would include the actionable items that we've talked about tonight. So dispatch, uh, data collection, philosophical discussion, uh, community members, um, and, and where that fits in our now, our midterm, and our long-term. Um, I hope that makes sense, Mr. City Manager. It does. Um, Mr. Aslan. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, so the bottom line is I, I could see myself being um, enthusiastic about any of these recommendations as long as it's the right fit um, and as long as the partners that are going to be implementing this agree that it's the right fit. Uh, and I, I don't know where to leave it aside from that, except that we, I, I'd like to see more input from our community partners and our social service providers, especially those who interact heavily with our Native American um, community. <clears throat> and uh, I do agree that we need uh, to put a couple uh, new services in place um, so that we're, we, we have a way to, to, to process and funnel folks into the right, um, into the right services. Uh, I don't know if you need more detail than that. No, I think that's good. Uh, City Manager. I, I would also add that I, I'd like to see this happen as quickly as possible. I, I heard a couple of council members um, give a month, a, a month ish timeline. And to the extent that that's reasonable, well, I think we should we should try to be as quick as we can. City Manager. Uh, that conversation has helped a lot, Mayor. So to sum up, um, yeah, we'll we'll be coming back to this council and we will schedule it as soon as we can. I, I just want to remind the council where the agendas are getting pretty hefty, but we know the importance of this. Uh, so coming back your way with a continued discussion with more refinement of uh, the preferred alternatives, likely focusing on more than one, but maybe drilling down on one uh, and a little bit more involvement uh, with our, uh, who would be likely uh, involved stakeholders or partners uh, in this, recognizing uh, that we're probably looking at a uh, multi-tiered approach that will, as uh, Ms. Whalen uh, summarized, uh, be the immediate, the midterm, and the long term, which I which I think is a very good approach here, because uh, the, the, you know it's way too much of a lift to, to try to solve it all uh, in year one. Uh, but looking out ahead as as to what long term remedies could be makes a lot of sense. So I, I think we'll we'll take that approach, and also Mayor, to your comment, which has been well received by your colleagues, uh, certainly uh, 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 looking to NAU to help us perhaps with a rapid response assessment uh, of this as we start implementation of it. Uh, the other thing it, that, that, and I'll end with this and, and then invite any other uh, directions you would like to give us, uh, it goes without saying that um, this is, uh, even though we've been emphasizing the need for action, putting this into place will take some time. Uh, the action here is coming up with a plan and a strategy and starting to put the pieces together and, and the funding and so forth, the partnerships. Uh, but implementing that uh, into boots on the ground uh, sort of uh, in, a, action uh, will take some time and it will take resources. Uh, so uh, maybe we could start establishing some sort of timeline as to what that might look like 
uh, when we have the next discussion or shortly thereafter. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Council. Um, I think I see our city attorney would like to weigh in. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Mayor and Council. I just wanted to um, chime in and mention that uh, uh, from the perspective of the alternative model, we've had uh, City Prosecutor Brent Harris involved uh, in great detail with a lot of the discussions at CJCC. He even made a trip back to Florida to look at some of the things that they do there. I would uh, strongly encourage the Council to have Brent included in that process and the discussion going forward as well. Thank you. Well, we're going to go ahead and move on. We're going to go down to item number nine. That is public participation. City Clerk, is there any public participation for this item? Yes, Mayor, we have one and I will go ahead and call him now. Introducing yourself. Now? Yes. Go ahead. Mayor, uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Vice Mayor and City Council members. Um, I, I would like to circle back to the uh, comments at the beginning of the meeting about site and release and advocate for a more robust use of this policy and greater transparency and accountability. My name is Marcus Ford and I, I too am with uh, Keep Flagstaff Together. As you know, the Flagstaff Police Policy Policy 420.3.3 reads, under Arizona law, the arresting officer of a misdemeanor offense has discretion whether to conduct a full custodial arrest or issue a, cite, a citation and a summons to appear. When deciding whether to book or cite and release factors that must not be considered are a person's race, ethnicity, said the national origin or gender, it is the policy of this department, I'm still quoting, that a site and release will be issued on misdemeanor offenses when possible. However, under the following circumstances, an officer should normally make a full custody arrest and then list those circumstances. To my mind, this is a perfectly reasonable and just policy. Whenever possible, a person suspected of a certain misdemeanor crime should not be booked into jail. And when deciding who is taken into custody and who is not, race, ethnicity, national origin, or gender should not be deciding factors. The question is, or my question is, how fully is this policy put into practice? We know, for example, that last year, 444 individuals were arrested for shoplifting, a crime that's eligible for site and release. When I contacted Chief Musselman this summer to see how many of those individuals were taken into custody and how many were cited and released, he said, quote, we don't know. In our record keeping, we don't distinguish between a custodial arrest and the site and release arrest. If the police don't don't know how many individuals are cited and released for misdemeanors, then they cannot possibly know what factors are or not being taken into consideration when people are being booked into jail. And if the police don't know, then the public doesn't know. Having a good policy is not sufficient. We need to have data that shows that these policies are being adhered to. On behalf of Keep Flagstaff Together, we urge you, the City Council, to pass a resolution or an ordinance requiring greater transparency in policing, especially as it pertains to nonviolent misdemeanors. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else for public participation? 
There is not, Mayor. Okay. We're going to go down to item number 10. This is informational items to and from Mayor, Council, City Manager, and future agenda item requests. We are going to start with Ms. Whelan tonight. Thank you, Mayor. You caught me off guard. Um, nothing tonight. Thank you. Let's go to Ms. Salas. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Just uh, uh, a gentle reminder. Tomorrow is the, the Discover Flagstaff Annual Stakeholder and Partner Meeting from 9 to 10.30 a.m. Uh, online. Uh, the speaker is, um, we'll talk about uh, the path forward recovery tools for tourism. Um, so there's still time to RSVP if you're interested in uh, attending the online uh, Discover Flagstaff CVV annual stakeholder and partner meeting. Thank you. We have Ms. Rodegaard. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to um, recognize that yesterday was uh, Indigenous Day uh, for our community here in the city of Flagstaff. Um, uh, it looked like it was very well attended from the amount of participants uh, through uh, virtual um, meetings. Um, and then thank you, Mayor Evans, uh, for reading the proclamation and recognizing uh, the day uh, yesterday. And then I really wanted to thank um, our officers um, from a couple days ago of exercising uh, restraint um, when it was a, a very challenging situation. Um, it's very commendable of our officers um, how they handled themselves um, with the crowd that was downtown the other night. So, and that's about it. And I appreciate it. It was a good meeting. Mr. McCarthy. Um, I'll just say we did have a good meeting. I agree with Mr. Odegaard, and uh, thank you. That was I was the one who brought forward this uh, item about uh, alternate policing methods. I don't have anything beyond that tonight. Thank you, Mr. Aspen. Madam Mayor, I don't have anything. City, uh, wait, Vice Mayor. <laughs> hey, Mayor. So thank you. That's all good. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you all so much for a great conversation today on a lot of good topics. I also would like to give a shout out to Rose Tohi, our coordinator for Indigenous Initiatives for putting on an excellent Indigenous Peoples Day yesterday. And all the conversations that were had were, 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 were great in my opinion. And I think were very important and, and challenging at times, but conversations that need to be had. And I'm just glad that we're having them. And so thank you for your efforts on that, Ms. Tohi. Um, I'd like to thank um, the efforts by the invasive plant rangers. I don't know how many members of councils opened up that email and saw that video that was shared with us. And, and you know, when we have volunteers walking the community in neighborhoods picking invasive plant plants by hand, that, pr that prevents us from using chemicals and pesticides. So, so shout out to the volunteers that got involved. Um, and it was a nice video that was put together. And then just to um, Heidi in the Economic Vitality Division, uh, the September report was was great. I really appreciate it. Learn about all the great things that they're working on and have done. And I look forward to tomorrow's um, event as well. Um, and I think there's one other Black Lived Experience event coming up this weekend. Mayor, maybe you can talk to that. Um, I forget exactly when that is, but I think it's on Sunday. And I'm all the members of the community to join us at 2 p.m. and to get get on that call. Um, thank you all for a great conversation and have a great rest of your evenings. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Council. I have nothing further to add, but I want to uh, state what was mentioned in the chat column earlier. The City Clerk, her staff, and myself will put our heads together to see if we can't streamline the um, public participation comment protocol so that there's less downtime. We, we recognize that it's a bit awkward, uh, although it's been effective, uh, but we're gonna see if we can improve that. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
So I wanted to just mention, um, there are some Black lived experience community dialogue sessions coming up. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. There's two different things happening. So on Wednesday at six o'clock, there's a conversation about education. And next Sunday, there is a conversation about restorative justice and what that means. Um, one is at six o'clock on Wednesday and on Sunday, it's at two o'clock. Both of those are streamed live. Also, if you didn't have the opportunity to participate in the community on town halls that the um, Southside Community Association was um, was hosting, there is a um, there is the ability to do so this weekend um, in person. They are going to be having three different sessions at the Murdoch Community, C community Center. Each one will be limited to 20 people so that social distancing can be achieved and masks will be required where they are going to be going over all six topics at one time to get community input and feedback. You can find out more by going to the Southside Community Association's um, Facebook page or the uh, Murdoch Community Center's Facebook page. So with that, if there's nothing further, we are adjourned. Thank you.